Okay, so welcome to the weekly GMBN Tech Show. Back again, we've got some great stuff. We've got some tech information on the new SRAM dub system. We've got some amazing bike cave entries in you guys. And we've got some pretty controversial tech products in as well. Join us on the show. So I wanna start this week's show with a little bit of a confession. So the last couple of weeks, I've been riding some drop handlebars off-road. Now, before you cut me in half, this isn't the sort of thing I would normally do. Rob from Nukeproof dropped me a line. He said, take this bike out for a ride and have a little go. So it's the Nukeproof Digger. So it's a gravel bike. It's got 650B wheels, 42 tires, and drop bars. But my point about this is, I've been out riding this in some pretty horrendous conditions, and it's as back to basics as you can get. And it, to many respects, it feels like riding a mountain bike in the early 90s, which is when I started mountain biking. So some of that actually was pretty nostalgic, but what made me really think about this was the fact that I wasn't using a dropper post, although it had disc brakes on it, you can't use that full power because you simply lock up the wheels all the time. There's no suspension, so you're bouncing and pinging off the rocks, your hands are hurting. It's really made me realize since I've got back on my normal mountain bike that we actually take tech for granted. So you think how good soft compound tires are, you think how good dropper seat posts are, wide handlebars, powerful brakes, that suspension that not only feels comfortable to ride, but how it keeps the wheels on the ground for all that traction, it's amazing. So I wanna start this week by having a poll and we'll pick this up next week. So out of these four options, which one do you think you couldn't live without with the most? So dropper posts, suspension, disc brakes, and clipless pedals. Get voting on that and we'll pick this one up next week. Okay, so now it's time for tech news, and there's been loads of stuff going on in the office this week. We've all been chatting about the new SRAM dub system. So that is Durable Unified Bottom Bracket, and it's SRAM's latest sort of invention, and what they're bringing to the table with the bottom bracket sort of dilemma that's been going on. So most mountain bikes these days tend to have a threaded bottom bracket with a 24 mil steel axle and outboard bearings. And it works quite well, but after a while the bearings fail and you end up replacing the bottom bracket, or if you've got one with interchangeable bearings, pop in some new bearings and away you go. Now there are a whole bunch of different systems on the market, BB30, Pressfit 92s, there's loads of different ones. And they all have similar problems. Some of them are, in fact, it costs a lot of money to manufacture the frame to get the tolerances right. Other ones you get the composite shells creaking within the frame if they're press fit. So SRAM have readdressed all of this and they've got the 30 mil axle, it's aluminium, it's very light system. Um, when I say 30 mil, it's actually 28.99, but they're referring to it as a 30 mil system. Outboard bearings, and the beauty of this whole system by SRAM is it doesn't matter what frame you have, there is an option for you. So you're not restricted by having a BB30 or anything like that. There is bottom bracket options to suit all of the main common options out there. Now the thing that's especially good about this new SRAM system is the fact that they've addressed the problem of bottom brackets disintegrating and it's not always down to the bearing size and the torque that goes through them. It's actually the muck and grunt that goes into those bearings. And if you recall, looking at most common bottom brackets these days, after a while you jet wash them, water gets in, cunt comes in, and it just generally fall to pieces. So what they've done is they've built this system around the most durable and weatherproof system as they possibly can. So that is their aim and their intention for it. As a result of it, some of the lighter options are actually the lightest on the market. The previous lightest system was a Race Face Next SL, so a full carbon crank setup. And they're some way underneath that. If you look on screen, you can see some shots of the scales now. And it's like, it's a pretty big thing for SRAM to have this new system. And I just like the fact that it's something there for everyone. You don't have to upgrade to this now. In future, when you upgrade your cranks, you're free to do this. And it comes with a bottom bracket that will suit your frame. Nice one. So the next bit of news we've seen is the new transition carbon smuggler. So this is one that I feel especially about. So it's a 29 inch wheel trail bike with 140, 120 mil travel. And that in my eyes is almost a perfect bike. So they have their new speed balanced geometry on that. It's basically the long low slack thing, except transitions doing it their way. And interestingly, they're reducing the fork offset on that to further improve that handling. This bike really is stunning. Check it out. Next up in the news is Jeff Gulovich, the Canadian freerider, is no longer representing Rocky Mountain Bikes. So Rocky Mountain Bikes have been in mountain biking since its start in the 80s, and they're also based in Canada, uh, Vancouver in fact, and Jeff has been riding for them for 11 years. 
Now it's quite strange for someone like him to move on, but all I can think of is he's seen what fellow Canadian freerider Darren Berikloff has done with Canyon Bikes, so the European company, and seeing how much more progressive he's been in his approach to his riding career. Now we did see a shot, could be a leaked shot, on Michaela Gatto's Instagram stories of a bike that looked very much like a focused Sam. So, but it had a sort of a camo dazzle print, I think you call it, paint job going on to sort of throw us off the scent. But since then, being in stories, it's actually disappeared. So we want to know, is he riding for focused bikes? Is he focusing on his future? Let us know in the comments below. So next up is standards, and there are a lot of standards, or so-called standards in mountain biking. This one's actually quite cool though, and it comes from Nolly Bikes, another Canadian company. So they've just announced that their entire range, moving forwards from now, are gonna have the new 157 mm rear end. So that's like quite a substantial raise on the 148 boost system that's currently available. Now they're calling this Super Trail, and they're saying this is the best thing. You've got a wider stance for the wheel, so it's a bit more triangulated and braced, so a lot stronger and stiffer. But the way they've developed it, unlike the previous 157, which was for downhill bikes, is that they're using a regular 73 mm bottom bracket. So the Q factor is just like riding a bike that's got boost. So your chain line is the same, your heels aren't gonna clip the frame or anything, but the back end is nice and wide for stability and support. I say new standard, but Pivot actually do something, and Pivot call it Super Boost Plus. So they've been doing this for a while, and also Mondraker did this a couple of years ago on their Crafty Plus. Is it another daft standard? Is it a great standard? Or is it just something that we think people should be riding? Personally, I think it's a really good idea, and I'm actually starting to wonder if Boost 148 should have happened. Maybe they should have gone straight to 157. What do you guys think? Let's pick this up in the comments below. Okay, so next up is a new set of wheels coming from Halo. Now, you may or may not have heard of Halo. They're a British company, but they've also got a US part of their business, so they are definitely getting out there. And there's certainly a few riders representing them in Europe. Now, they've got the new Vortex Enduro wheels, and this is a really good price point set of wheels. It's been really, really well thought out. So, from the start, they've got a 6061 T6 alloy rim with a 38 mil external and 33 mil internal width. Now, previously, I've always thought 30 mil is a really good size, so it's interesting they've gone up three mil extra there. They've done this for tire stability, and I'm sure it does definitely do that. I need to see a pair in the flesh myself. Now, they use regular conventional double-butted spokes, the same spokes you can get in any bike shop around the world. So you snap spokes, dead easy to replace those. And they use the SuperDrive rear hub. So the SuperDrive rear hub has got 120 point pickup on it, which is huge. And that's because it's got 13 micro teeth on each of these pulls. Now take a listen to this. It's only a three degree between pickups. That's like, there's virtually nothing there. Absolutely amazing little rear hub on these things. Now the retail price for these in the UK is about 410 quid. They're coming 27 off and 29. Very reasonable weights as well. The 27.5 are just under 2,200 grams and the 29s are just under 2,300 grams. They come in standard and boost and SRAM XD or regular driver bodies. Check them out. Now Hope, the British company, world renowned for making aluminium brakes themselves in-house in Barnaldswick, have been making a carbon fiber super bike. Now this thing is like, it's called the HB160, a beautiful looking enduro bike, but it's a whopping 7,500 pounds. So I actually think that's above the superbike class and more like in the hyperbike category. So over Christmas, one of the founders of Hope, Ian Weatherall, decided that he really didn't like the fact it was so expensive because he didn't really want the bikes to be too far out of reach. And he wanted to reflect the fact that the UK is good for manufacturing and wants to inspire more people to do it. So they've done something we've never heard of any bike manufacturer doing and they reduced the price of the bike, but significantly. They've locked off 2,000 pounds off the cost of that bike, taking down to five and a half grand rather than seven and a half. But the thing that's especially different about this is the fact that they're refunding that 2,000 pounds that anyone has bought one of those bikes previously. That's a pretty amazing thing to do. Way to go, Hope. So now it's time to show you a look at last week's show and look back at some of you guys in the comments you've been sending in. So don't forget you can email us, the address is on the screen and of course you can add your comments right below this very video. I do go through all of these, it, is, it takes me a long time to do it so you've got to bear with me. I have some helpers but we can't answer everything because the response has been so overwhelming but thank you and keep them coming. So first one is from Yudkash Singh. I'm so happy the editors put the Meta uh, the Meta HT frame in there. Honestly, I want you to do a do it all hardtail like the Instigator or the Meta, because that's what I think a lot of the average Joes would like. 
not too much maintenance, but can be used in a lot of places. Yeah, you know what, I love hardtails. I've said this for a long time. Neil's not so keen on hardtails these days, but I do think that you learn most of your skill set on them and they're a really realistic bike for people to ride. Um, whether the hardtail makes it in or not, we'll find out later. Goat rides bikes, short punchy bits. How about a short punchy history of Shimano Airlines? Uh, the nutty pneumatic downhill shifters. Yeah, well, I, I don't know too much about Shimano Airlines. I know they were released in 1999. I know they had an air canister, which you could pump up manually to get the charge in there. And obviously once it runs out, you could pump it up. There'll be airlines running to a pneumatic rear derailleur and that would change the gears. But what I did find when I did a bit of research online is there's a website called Disraeli Gears, a UK based website, and it's pretty much got the history of the rear mech. And if you look on screen now, you can see the very original catalogue of the Shimano Airlines. So if you want to read that, click on the link, it's below in the description, and you can see that catalogue for yourself and see all that information. I mean, I would love to see a set of the Shimano Airlines in the flesh. I've never had the chance, so if anyone out there has a set or they know someone who's got some, put me in touch with them, that'd be really cool. Cheers. Next up, Mike Tarry. Uh, the only current rider I can think of for two bike sponsors is Danny McCaskill, Santa Cruz and Inspired, of course. Um, suppose you could count John Tomac back in the day when he raced uh, road and mountain bike with Eddie Merckx on road and Yeti. Um, yeah, also he did um, Rally and 7-Eleven. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. As you point out, Danny McCaskill has two sponsors and the same with Fabio Vibner actually, and both of them share Inspired, which is that trials brand. And I'm taking a guess it's because Specialized who uh, Fabio rides for, and Santa Cruz, who Danny rides for, don't make trials bikes. So there's no real conflict of interest there. Whereas with Julian Absalon, actually it is a bit of a conflict of interest because he's riding for Mustache, who make e-bikes, and BMC, who also make e-bikes as well as conventional bikes. So granted, you guys are right, you called me out on it, but it's a bit of a strange situation to be riding a bike like that in Julian's situation. Uh, Neil Terry, why don't you have a presenter challenge with all the guys from GMBM? Set a budget, let's say 750 quid, and see who can build the best bike for normal day-to-day -day riding. The idea being to source used parts or bargains from shops. Not everyone can afford to get the latest and new bikes. We'd all love a dream bike, but few can actually do that. You could give tips on where to buy stuff new, how to refurbish. Ah, oh, do you know what? I love that idea. I am all over that. We are actually going to do that. We'll find a way of doing it. I'll chat with Neil and Blake and all the guys, and we'll put that one in motion. Nice suggestion. Uh, Jack Dempsey. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't actually talk about the dropper posts in this video, despite it being called Rise of the Dropper Posts. I'd quite like a bit of a history lesson on how they came to be and how the designers, etc. Yeah, absolutely right, Jack, you called me out there. Um, basically, we shouldn't have left that tight wind. There was going to be a few more dropper post related stories, but they never made it in. However, this is the Height Right, and this was developed by Josh Angel and Joe Breeze. So two of the mountain bike pioneers. And this is the predecessor to the dropper post. So this arguably is where the dropper post came from. Now, this part clamps around your seat post. This part clamps onto the seat clamp. And when you undo the quick release, you can sit down, saddle drops, do a quick release up and it stays there. So not much of an advantage, I get it. But when you undo the quick release, it springs back up and it stays in the same position. Your saddle doesn't twist to either side. So actually it's just a nice workaround having to stop your bike undo the quick release, lower your saddle, put the quick release back up, because you could do this when you're riding. The downside is it did demand a frame to have like perfect reaming on the seat tube and a really good sort of tolerance so the seat tube would allow the seat post to slide inside. Really good, and that is where the dropper post came from, but I've written a script on the evolution of the dropper post and that is coming soon, so keep your eyes for that. And finally, from Anders Vagdis, loving GMBN tech so far, keep up the great work. Are there any flat pedal shoes that have aggressive tread at the heel and the toe, like the Cedric Gracia ones you showed? My 510s grip the pedals perfectly, and the ground not at all. Kind of tricky with flat pedals because the nature of them, most people move their feet around, they give you a nice big flat section on the sole of the shoe so it grips that. But there is a company called OWN, and that stands for only what's necessary. And they make a shoe called the FR01. So it's a modular shoe, it comes with two inner booties. One is for cold weather, it's fleece lined and weather resistant. The other one sort of a mesh type affair for hot weather. The outer boot is one piece, you can just hose it down. And the sole is a totally custom Vibram piece. So the section in the middle which contacts with the pedal is more or less flat to get maximum grip. But the toe and the heels have really aggressive lugs, so actually they're pretty good off the bike as well. 
They're never gonna be quite as aggressive as a walking shoe or the SPD type shoes, given the nature of those soles, but it's probably the next best thing. Check them out. Okay, so now it's time for Bike Cave. I'm really impressed with the amount of entries that have been coming in. Keep them flying in. Use the hashtag Bike Cave if you're sending that in by email. And the same in the comments below or on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, really impressed with the level of them that have been coming as well. There's all sorts. I want to see some more sort of random ones as well. Fixing the bike in the back of the car. Doing it in the front room while you're other half watching TV. Any of that stuff. Keep them flying in. Okay, so this week, first one is Ali Tennant. Uh, he says, loving the GMBN Tech channel, check out my bike cave. Nice, you've got a canyon in there. And you've got a nice sort of cab on the back there. Good solid workbench with vice. Nice, tidy. Next up, we've got Glenn Blacker from Hertfordshire. Even got a poster of Martin and Blake and Sam Pilgrim on the wall. Oh my God, how young does Blake look in that? My God, he's changed. Martin doesn't look any different. That's pretty amusing. Loving the selection you've got in there, like the wood panelling. Kind of similar to the one I'm building at home. Nice little desk by the wooden, desk by the wooden sort of window frame there. We've got the wall there, balanced bikes. A couple of bikes stashed in there, nice work. Next up, Jack or Tucker from Bend in Oregon. Dude, that is not, that is not a garage, that is vast. What else in there have you got? So you've got your Sasquatch bike, I see another mountain bike at the back there. A couple of motocross bikes, a couple of skilly, man, you've got some serious toys in that garage. I'm not liking that, that is far too good. Uh, next up, Joe Baldwin, here is my bike cave. Oh my God, what's going on with the size of your place? That is massive. You've got very nice YT, is that a Capra? Up against the wall there, looks really nice, but definitely feels like you could get three or four more bikes in there. Maybe you should start saving Joe. Uh, next up is uh, Kel Thompson from Colbera Beach in Australia. Nice, that's a very clean workshop. Good sort of headspace in there as well. That'd be good for me, I always bang my head in this place. And nice, oh, you look so like you've got a puncture, you need to be actually be using your workshop, not taking pictures of it, I think. But nice entry. And uh, Marty Pointer is up next. Oh, that is tidy, into that. That is a dedicated sort of bike cave. All the tools on the wall there. Got TV in the corner. Got your Scott hanging up in the, in the stand there, ready for action. And a dad's shed hanging from the ceiling. Well into that, nice work. And finally, we've got one more from uh, Wes Minion. Oh, Wes. You're a man after my own heart. Bikes hanging up neatly in the corner. You've got your sort of stuff to clean the bikes with there. Works down, it's really good. I love the illumination above that. Nice. Great stuff, guys. So keep them coming in. We want to see them. We're going to start sharing them on the Facebook page as well because we're getting so many in. We, we need to share the love a bit. So keep an eye out on the GMBN Tech Facebook page. And if you don't already, give it a like. Give it a like. Now it's time for Rewind, which is our flashback retro section of the show where we check out loads of retro kit, tell you the stories of where the modern kit came from and show you some of those examples. But you guys have been inundating us with all your retro bikes. So for the time being, we're gonna keep going through those because there's some really interesting stuff coming in. So first up is Jim Chang with his Cannondale Jekyll 900 SL. Do you know what? I always wanted one of those. That is such a nice bike and they were so good when they first came out. They've got that really low pivot on the back and it's really quite stiff as well. Has the head shock, which was definitely a love or hate thing. Personally, I thought they looked amazing. And I did have one, I had a bit of a Martin Ashton replica myself. Um, so I, I really like the head shock for all its sort of flaws. It was just a beautiful piece of kit, really nicely engineered. That is lovely. And he's put some wider bars on it and he's got a one by drivetrain. And by the looks of it, you're riding it now. So that's nice to see that stood the test of time. So next up, we've got Stephen Connor. And this is, well, this is an ancient Fisher Pro Calibre. And this is what happens when you stop riding your mountain bike, you use it to commute on. So looking at that, it looks like there might be possibly Richie Cranks on there. I can see a height right on there. And you're right to say, yeah, Gary Fisher might have been one of the first bike makers to have done dropper posts. He also turned down an original dropper post manufacturer. So we'll pick that story up later. But that's really nice to see that original steel bike and the fact you're still using it. That's two bikes now that are still being ridden. Now the next one is a bit of an unusual one. A lot of you might not have seen these bikes. So it's branded up here as a Mercedes and it's Richard Way's bike. But it's actually an Amp Research B4 and it's got like the etching on the seat mask and the graphics on the top tube and head tube. So the Amp Research bikes are some of my all time favorites. So the Amp B1 and B2, oh, I have to have one, especially one with a skinny double down tube. They had the first FSR pivot point on there, the Horse Lightning creation, the McPherson strut shock actuation. 
and of course the Amp Research fork as well. Now the fork, it did work quite well, but I, I did hear down the grapevine over the years that they did tend to leak quite a bit, but do you know what, I'd have one now. I think that is a stunning bike. And there's quite a few nice bits on there as well. I've also noticed that one of the bits that a lot of people might not even realize exists, you've got RockShox disc brakes on there. So yes, RockShox, that's right, they made disc brakes way back in the day, and they were hydraulic calipers, and the caliper itself floated. So only one side, one side of the piston moved, and as you braked, it would move the caliper. So effectively, both, both sides would clamp the disc rotor. And even as a hydraulic caliper, it was cable actuated. So that's a really cool thing, and they are rare as rocking horse. And finally, what I think is a bit of a masterpiece, this is James Birkinshaw with his GT RTS1. He says, sorry about the Onza pedals, they never let me down. Well, I'm sorry about that too, because I do like them, even though I didn't think they were very good back in the day. But your bike is absolutely stunning. So you've got Synchro stem on there, the USC seat post, I had one of those, the Veta TT saddle, had one of those as well. This is like a trip down memory lane. And I can't quite see what the tires are. They look like the Tioga Mud Dogs or something like that. Rock Shogs Mag 21s. And you've got every bicycle mechanics nightmare on there, the snowflake wheel. Oh. Why do people do that? They looked great, but an absolutely nightmare to build and a nightmare to true. They did kind of look cool though, didn't they? Hmm. Nice work, guys. Keep that stuff coming in, even if it's just a single retro piece you've got or an old sort of toe clips or anything random. And if there's stuff that you want me to talk about on the show, about where stuff came from, how it was developed, let us know in the comments and we'll see where we can go with this. Okay, so now it's time for top mods, and I'm really pleased after last week's efforts that there's been loads coming. So many, in fact, I've only been able to feature a few, so keep them coming in. We will start sharing these on our Instagram page and on the Facebook page as well, and the best ones of the week will get onto the show, so please keep sending them in. First one is from Louis Homer. I had my sag set correctly, but I was bottoming out my shock a bit easily on my Santa Cruz. Decided to fit some volume spacer to shocks that ramps up a bit more. Good man, volume spacer to solve a lot of problems with how bike rides. Nice easy job with noticeable results. No problem working in the front room either. The wife is a massive GMBN tech fan. Oh, a big shout out to both of you. Thank you very much for watching. And thanks for your entry, that's really good. Next one is from Dan Abt. Uh, hi GMBN Tech, such a great channel. Looking forward to your content. I've got a really simple frame production mod that myself and friends use on chain stays, especially carbon fiber stays. Rubber mastic tape, Scotch 3M 2228, works perfectly. Do you know what? I actually recommend people use this myself as well. I've used it for years, absolutely swear by it. Dan, you're the man for sending this one in. That is a really, really good mod. Next up, Alan Sanders. I took the decision to change my drivetrain on the little old giant Talon hardtail from its 3x9 system to a modern SRAM SLX 1x11. It's the best thing I've ever done. Dude, you're absolutely right. Going by 1x11 is really good. It looks clean. You're getting rid of a lot of the bulk. You're getting rid of cables and the front mech and stuff. And as you point out, you lost 750 grams off the weight of your bike by doing it. If that's not a reason to go one by, what is? Um, also, in doing that, he also says that he did a fork change he was, he was forced to make because he over tightened a brake bolt and split part of his bike. So he ended up getting a Suntour Radon air fork for 130 quid off eBay and he's taken 1.3 kilos off the entire weight of the bike. So that is like double standards. That is really good work, Alan. Keep sending those in. Uh, next one and the last one for this week is from Chris Jackson. Thought you'd like to see my hack upgrade for my One Up EDC. So this is a tool that fits inside the head tube of your bike, a really, really amazing sort of tool, gadget, that's got all the Allen keys and chain tool stuff on it you need. But what he's done is he cut the thread off an old CO2 cartridge and soldered it in the handle from a tubeless repair kit. So he's got a tubeless repair kit built into this thing. So you can pull it out of the head tube, stab it into a tire of his bike, fix it and get back on the trails. That is a really, really good hack. Well impressed with that, Chris. Nice work. So now it's time for Tech of the Week, and I was drawn to this by chatting to Neil and Steve from EMVN about punctures and problems they've been having on their e-bikes. And Neil tipped me off about this guy called Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, he solves problems, apparently. I'm Mr. Wolf, and I solve problems. So, got in touch with Mr. Wolf, and we've got some of these in. So, this is called the Banger, and this goes inside your tire, and it completely changes the way the rear wheel of the bike rides. So unlike a lot of other rim strips that go in to protect the rim and protect the tire against splitting, these pretty much fill up your tire cavity completely. 
and they're made from a low density techno polymer. So it's a very different handling sort of rubber to the other ones you'll have seen on the market. Now the crazy thing about this is it reduces the air volume inside your tire by 95%. So this really adds a sort of a different feeling to the bike as well as stopping the rim getting bottomed on rocks and stuff. So it claims to reduce the chance of punctures by 90%. That is an enormous amount. And if that works, that is truly a fantastic piece of kit. But it also reduces lateral vibrations, reduces longitudinal vibrations, and it costs 99 euros. And they do these in all sorts of different sizes to suit different bikes. We haven't tried them yet ourselves, so we're gonna give them a go and see what you think. I have tried some other options in the past. I've tried the Huck Norris liners. I've also tried Schwalbe Procore, and Procore is fantastic, but it's very expensive. So I'm liking where Mr. Wolf is going with this. Also though, coming from Mr. Wolf, something a bit controversial at the moment. So you may have noticed Sam Hill with hand guards racing the EWS, and Mr. Wolf has sent us a set of these to have a look at. They're a bit bigger than hand guards, I think though, because you, you think where your hands would sit on the bars, they cover your controls, there's room for your cables to come through here if they need to. I really like the idea of these on principle, especially in the UK for times like spring where the brambles and stuff come out and they're whipping your hands. And even for certain bike events like the Mega Avalanche where you've got a lot of other riders, elbows coming in, hitting your handlebars and your brakes. So from that point of view, they're really good, but I'm just not sure if I can ever really like them myself. What do you think? Is it a love? Is it hate? Do you want to kill them with fire? Let us know in the comments below. So that was the end of this week's show. Don't worry about the bike build. I am gonna come back to you with some very exciting news shortly on that. In the meantime, get those comments coming in below. Fire them into the email address. Please don't forget to use those hashtags. So bike cave, top mods, and rewind. Makes it a lot easier for me to see those and add them into next week's show. So keep them firing in. As always, click on the globe to subscribe. There's brand new content coming for you every single week on GMBN Tech. If we see a couple more videos, I'm gonna throw you up here to last week's Tech Ask Clinic where we answer all your questions. And in particular, I'll talk about all the bottom bracket options that are in there. Bit of a minefield of information, so definitely worth a catch up on that one. If you wanna click down here, there's five tools that all of you should have to start off your home workshop kit with. And of course, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up.